Today we begin a new series called God at Work. We will take three weeks to explore the work we do and how we can find God even in the workplace. Today we start with who it is we work for. This is masters and servants. And I want us to begin by imagining what it might look like to be surrounded at work with the best employees. If you're a student, what does school look like if it is filled with the best students? For you bosses, what does work look like for you to be the best boss you can be? I wonder if you remember your first job. Think back. For some of you, it's more than others. What was the first place that ever employed you? When I was young, I had a paper route and a few odd jobs, but when I turned 16, my mom and dad told me I had to go out and get a job. They were cutting me off. Now, I didn't have a car, so I tried to find the closest job to my house as I could. There was a restaurant two doors down from where I lived, and I put an application in. Never heard back from them. There was a plaza about a half mile down the street. I put in an application in all 20 stores that filled the plaza. Never heard back from any of them. Uh, Finally, I broke down and put in an application at McDonald's. Even they didn't call me back. I was at a real low point, and finally my dad, who worked on the corporate side of a grocery store, said, Brian, go apply at the supermarket. Not the close one, mind you, the one that was two and a half miles away that I would have to walk to and from each day. Uh, So I put the application in, and they had a right position for this corporate executive son. They put me in the meat department. (laughs) My job was to clean up the department with a spray hose after a day of cutting was over. Not only was it quite possibly the grossest job in the store, it was always wet, always cold, and followed by that two and a half mile walk back home, even in cold buffalo winters. I also learned some new words while working there. (laughs) I thought high school students were crude, but they've got nothing on the men in your local meat department. The words they used and the way they talked about some of the people they knew, it was completely unbelievable to me. That was my first job. And you might be thinking like I did uh, after a, a, a little bit of time working there. I thought to myself, you know, I'm really just not cut out for work. <laughs> not only did I not like doing it, I felt like it was a waste of time because it wasn't very important. You might also be thinking to yourself that the job you have is maybe a waste of time. Maybe you feel trapped in it like I did because of money or transportation. You have no options. It was this job or nothing for me. Maybe that's how it was for you. Despite how terrible the environment was for me, I felt like I had to do it. Have you ever felt like that? Work can feel very much like a punishment. And that's how a lot of people think about it. We are slaves to our jobs. We are controlled by the executives on top, or if you are on top, you feel like your job never ends. No matter how much time and energy you pour into it, you always need to spend more time doing it. No time for your husband or wife, the kids or anyone else. It's work, work, work. I think what many of us crave is freedom. And we feel like work is enslaving us. It's stealing life from us, so work becomes the enemy. I remember growing up being told something similar. Do you know this story about Adam and Eve? They are in this perfect garden, but they sin against God by eating the fruit they weren't supposed to even touch, so God kicks them out of the garden. And what is their punishment? Besides having to leave this perfect garden, what does God make them do? Eve will suffer in giving birth to children, and Adam has to work the ground real.
really hard. The earth is cursed, and he has to toil all the days of his life. That sounds like God has made work our curse, doesn't it? But did you know, even before Adam and Eve broke the rules, God had already commanded Adam to till the garden and to keep it? Yeah, working the earth was already his job when they were in paradise. That says to me that work itself isn't the enemy. Work isn't what steals our freedom. And then we come to today's scripture. The Apostle Paul is writing to this town, and he wants to explain to Christians how they ought to act at home and at work. He starts with a group that still has its parallels today. He starts, he talks to the slaves and servants. Now, we might expect Paul to say to these servants, run away, get as far away as you can. Don't do anything your masters tell you to do. Get away from this cursed work. But that's not what he says. Paul doesn't call for rebellion. He tells these people, obey your earthly masters. And don't just do what looks good. Don't just pay them lip service or work hard when they are looking. No, genuinely do a good job. Be the best slave you can be. And you might expect when he writes to the slave owners to say, get rid of your slaves, stop being slave owners. But no, he says, be just and fair. Do the right thing for your slaves. Be the best master you can be. Then in between these statements, he addresses all of us. And all of us are somewhere between slaves and masters, aren't we? (laughs) If you're a boss, you command employees, and they generally do what you ask them to do. Employees, you might be treated poorly at work. It might feel like you are a slave, but we have to listen to our bosses. And though employees may just pay them lip service at times, or just work hard when the boss is looking, we know deep down that's not how it's supposed to be. We are supposed to do our work whether the boss is there or not. Now, it's not always clear how we should respond in every situation at work. Sometimes it's a little harder to know what is best. There's a story of a young executive who's leaving the office late one evening when he finds the CEO standing in front of a shredder with a piece of paper in his hand. Listen, says the CEO, this is a very sensitive and important document here, and my secretary has gone for the night. Can you make this thing work for me? Certainly, the young executive says. He turns the machine on, inserts the paper, and presses the start button. Excellent, excellent, says the CEO as his paper disappears into the machine. I just need one copy. (laughs) Oops. Whatever you're dealing with in the workplace, Paul wants to make one thing clear. And here it is. Paul says it in between addressing slaves and masters. He says, whatever your task, Whatever you do, put yourselves into it as done for the Lord. It doesn't matter what your job is. It doesn't matter what situation arises or how people treat you. You work for God, not for people. And when Paul says, put yourselves into it, He's not just saying, make sure you do a good job. The word is the same we would use for life and for soul. He's saying, put your heart and soul into it. Every task, every job, no matter what it is, is one done to God. Give it your absolute best. So if you're new here, this might be a bit of a stretch for you, but we believe that Jesus made it pretty clear that our life here on earth matters because there is a life after death. Jesus said things like, if you are faithful in the little things, you will be faithful in the big. And what he was referring to was doing our best in this life so that we are prepared and ready for the next. God has big plans for us, even after we die, so we need to pour out our best. We live for God, not for the people around us. 
Give your very best so you'll receive what God has for you in this life and in the next. Now, I think many of us struggle with this, and it's because our focus is on something else. We are focused on what and where, but God is focused on how and why. This week, someone shared with me the title of what he said was the most watched TED Talk in history. Some of you are familiar with this. It's called Start With Why. And in it, Simon Sinek talks about what he calls the golden circle. He draws three circles, and on the outside, he puts what. On the middle circle, he puts how. And on the inside, he puts why. Now, Simon is talking about the business world and compares what businesses do to advertise and sell products to what Apple does. He says Apple was very successful because they don't start with what Apple does and then tell you how they do it. No, Apple advertises first with the why. They say, we challenge the status quo. We believe in thinking differently. So how do they do that? They design everything with simplicity and beauty in mind. And they just happen to make computers, phones, and MP3 players. Now, uh, for us, I think there's something comparable to that in our own lives. We uh, start with the what too often, and then describe how we do it. We aren't going, if we do that, we're not going to make connections with people. We're not going to be very good advertisers to other people. Our businesses won't do a good job selling to people. The question, why, needs to be the central focus. What matters so much about why we do these things, not what we do. And it's the, the same for us when we do our work. Because we don't just do a job and make some money. We work for the Lord. And God is not trying to connect with us through what we do or worrying over what we do. God is concerned with why we do it. So let me ask you, why do you work? Why do you do it? Is it just to earn some money? Is it because you like this job more over the other jobs you could do? Some people are seeking after fulfillment. They want to find the perfect job that either requires almost nothing out of them so they can go and do other things that they like, or they want a job that fills some artistic or spiritual void. All those ideas are nice, but I don't think they fill the greater question of why we were created, why we are here on this earth. So often we want freedom to do what we want, to fulfill our felt needs. But really, God calls us to a very different kind of answer to why. God says to all people, even to slave masters, remember that you have a master in heaven. Jesus refers to even himself as the servant of God. Before Jesus was killed, he was with his disciples and he washed their feet. He was a servant among them. Jesus gave us an example of what it looks like to serve God the Master. His answer to the question, why, is that God is in charge. God is the Master, not us, not at our employers. Why do you work so hard? Even though your job isn't very important? Well, because God is the master. I work for God, not for people. I like what Andy Stanley has to say about this. He talks about the eternal value of our work. It's, and he says, it's not what we do, but why we do it. And he says, we may not have jobs that have some kind of eternal worth attached to them, but how we do these jobs is absolutely a determining factor in our eternity. Some of us get this intuitively in certain contexts. If you've heard me talk about my work here at the church or how our other employees work here at the church, you've probably heard me say that if you steal from the church, you're stealing from God. 
I think most of us can get behind a statement like that. If I slack off, if I don't do my job in this church, you could say I'm stealing from you. But the bigger problem, to me at least, is that I'm stealing from God. I actually think the same thing applies outside of the church context as well. It doesn't matter where you work, when you steal from your employer by tampering with the punch clock or being lazy when you're supposed to be working or even by being too hard on your employees that you're robbing from God. The reason behind our work, why we do it, is more important than what we do. It's not work for people, it's work that is evaluated by God. When you work hard, you bring glory to God. When you don't, you're not helping anybody. The question is not what we do, it's why we do it and how we do it. I wonder, what would tomorrow look like if you committed to do your job for God? What changes if you think of yourself as working for God? Do you wake up earlier? Do you talk differently? Are you nicer, softer, gentler in tone? Do you take more time talking with people and hearing them out? Do you eat a healthier lunch? Do you take advantage of the exercise equipment they have there? There are so many things that could change when we put God first, when we see Him as our master, not people, not the boss, but Jesus. Let me end with a story. A man bought a property to build a new house on, and he had his best friend design the home for him. Some people not, might not think that's so wise, but it ended up working fine for these two. One day when the friend was on the work site, they had their truck and crew scraping the ground to prepare the property for the next step. So they're working hard when a truck comes roaring down the street, music is blasting, and it's the porta john guy. It's a new person, they've never seen him before, but he's big and he has these tattoos all over his body and he's coming to pump out all the filth in the work site toilets. The workers realize who it is and they are working right next to the porta john. When they put two and two together, they all give out this collective Ugh, because they know it is going to stink to high heaven while that guy cleans out those toilets and they can't go anywhere. They're stuck at this particular spot working and it's just bad luck they are going to have to smell this. So the guy gets in the Porta Johns and he is taking a long time. I mean a long time. They are wondering if they're going to have to go in there and rescue the guy. But the strangest thing is that it never stinks. Actually, as the guy is finishing up, they notice this sweet aroma. It actually smells pretty good. And the guy finally comes out and the designer comes over to him and says, hey, that smells kind of nice. It actually makes me want to go in there. And the guy says, yeah, the last guy didn't do such a good job. It's going to be different from now on. And the designer says, well, thanks. And the Porta John guy responds with just five words that I think make all the difference. He said, I work for the Lord. What? I work for the Lord cleaning toilets? He doesn't clean a Porta John for a paycheck. Or for that crew, he does it because Jesus is the master. He knows that whatever his task is, whatever he does, he's going to do it for God. How many of us can say the same about the work we do? If a person can clean Porta Johns to the glory of God, I'm sure we can do it in our workplaces as well. Put your heart and soul into it. Serve the way Jesus served the disciples. He was the servant of God, which meant he served people. How are you going to do that in the workplace, in the church, and in your home? 
Whatever you do, do it for the Master. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's pray. <laughs> Lord God, we thank you for jobs, for work, for our students in their schools, for everyone who does meaningful work to make this world a better place. And we pray that whatever we put our hands to, whatever task is before us, that we might see how you call us to it, and that we might do our work for the Master, for Jesus Christ. Amen.